Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 276, my talk with poet and musician Andy N. But first, let's talk about our sponsors. Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. Sign up today for your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. You get a free audiobook download as well as access to hundreds of books and podcasts, including this one. Yeah, that's right. You can listen to Yes But Why through the Audible app if you like. Go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why to sign up and get your account today. Yes But Why podcast is also brought to you by podcastcadet.com. Podcastcadet.com is the company that my husband Chris and I run to help podcasters. Mention code YBY20 and you'll get 20% off the first service or workshop you buy with us. We can help. Podcastcadet.com. Yes, but why podcast is also brought to you by True Hemp Science. True Hemp Science is my resource for vegan friendly whole plant extract CBD oil. Check out TrueHempScience.com to see all the CBD products available to you. Use code YESBUTY7 to get 7% off your order of $50 or more. You get all the therapeutic goodness of CBD, plus a free packet of two CBD edibles with your order. I just had some of their cookies. Delish. TrueHempScience.com this week on Yes But Why, I had the opportunity to speak with Andy N., a poet, musician, and podcaster from Manchester, England. Andy N. is the author of six full-length poetry collections. He composes ambient electronic music as Ocean in a Bottle, and he produces four different podcasts. Whoa. Listen in as we chat about building a vibrant, creative community and connecting with artists all over the world. I now present to you, Yes But Why, episode 276. Poet, musician, Andy N. is overflowing with creativity. Enjoy. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why podcast. Yeah. I started writing when I was about six or seven, but my first surviving poem was when I was 10. I've got a terrible poem when I was 10. So I've got, I managed to save everything I've wrote since I was about 10. Whoa, that's amazing. Your biographer yeah, thanks you. Oh, he does, he does. He's my partner, actually. But um, what I do is I answer that kid saying, yeah, I've got them all in that little hardback A5 books. Every bit of my writing, I, I, I concluded some degree I was happy with, and I've done. I've got about fifty-five of them now. So, so and that took forty odd years to do fifty-five of them. So it's like, wow. and some of the pieces in the early ones are just like so much hysterical teenage rage. Oh. I cringe at them now, Johnson. You know what though? I find that I find that stuff is really helpful to look at when you're sort of reflecting on, you know, middle age rage. And um and you can be like, oh, I'm not mad about this thing that I was mad about twenty years ago. So maybe it'll ease up a little bit off of me now what I'm worried about. Because, you know, I I know that the passage of time is such that it's like, eh, I won't even be worried about this. I usually honestly only think like a year ahead. Like if I'm really mad, I'm like, okay, am I going to be mad about this in a year? I'm like, no. So it's like, meh, okay. That's why, that's why. I, I do have one funny story, man, if not that. Um, it's the second poem I ever wrote was we ended up going on a school trip when I was 11 to a local zoo, I'm not going to name which one, for <laughs> various reasons. But um, when I came back the day after school, we got asked to write a poem about the trip to the zoo. And I didn't like the teacher who was teaching me very much. So I wrote a poem called The Kill. And it was about um, a lion breaking out of the cage and eating the school teacher. <laughs> I got two weeks... <laughs> I got two weeks detention over that oh, in my life. <laughs> oh my goodness, you got in trouble? Oh. 
Oh my god! Oh, that's so funny. Oh, what did your terrible. What did your parents say? It was a topic. <laughs> <laughs> That's putting it nicely. <laughs> the only time I ever got oh. attention at school was oh. over that. I was at a, wow. a school I was pretty well behaved, like a boy to I was in teenage, I was very well behaved, so but this is unfortunate. The creativity got me in trouble. Yeah. Man, it is so funny this idea that you're, you know the power of your words got you in trouble. Like this yeah. artistic expression of what was going on in your head was what got you in trouble. That is so wild. Hey, so I find that hilarious. So that's why in hindsight, what I said is, at the time I really got in trouble was at school. I'm sure so childhood was fine. I'm sure so. But um, creativity, um, well, it, after I left school, I didn't quite really get, went dormant for some years. Sure. And I got to about 25 and I started writing again properly. And then I went to university at 28 to study creative writing. Oh. After I left university at 31, I joined a writing group a year or two later and and then it's carried on from there, from, from really. Huh. <laughs> Man, it's great that you were able to go to school for creative writing. Were you like, was it something where like you were like, nah, I don't need to go to school. And then the program seemed interesting. Like, was it like you were like, no, it's okay. I don't need to do this. But then, you know, the school turned out, you know, was calling your name like, oh, this is interesting. I want to um, get involved. In my case, was I got to the stage of my 20s. My life as a career wasn't going anywhere. I was in a job I didn't enjoy, and I was stuck in it, and there was no way out, really. And I thought to myself, I need to improve myself, because it's a good point here, this one, Amy, is when I left school when I was 16, I had next to no qualifications. I basically, I'm not, I didn't wag school or anything like that. I just gave up at the wrong time. Mm. And I got to 22, and I went back and re-educated myself almost completely. Mm. Actually, through going to lots of times evening classes, which are like you know, like qualifications you learn in the evening after after, after work. Yeah, then I did that for about six years and went to university on that. I did, and I knew at that stage I wanted to go to university. Yeah, after after teach learning for six years, and, and that's where it all started really for me. Creativity. You know, what's interesting is that I feel like. Um, there's just such a, a life journey that goes on after you turn 18, you have to like reinvent yourself and figure out like that time when between, you know, 16 to 22, when you're like, well, I guess I can make my own decisions now. And then it's like, turns out that's not as easy as we thought. And oh, yeah. the world is way harder than they, they told me, uh, what's going on here. Trying to find your place. Um, you know, why not take a moment, take that time to, you know, try things, figure it out. Plus, like, I feel like, you know, if every college student was in their late 20s, early 30s, it'd probably be a much cooler place because like people would actually be learning and caring about learning. I mean, I definitely went to college 18 to 21 and these were not my, you know, prime excellent learning years you know what i mean like i was there to have fun and i learned uh, as a side action you know but man that's that's really great that you were able to you know turn it around for yourself and that you like did the work to uh to get to the place to go to the creative writing school tell me about how that experience was was the school very, very, really yeah. great Never went to good school. And what I learned from a friend major was, and something came up. Now, have you heard of the term dyspraxia? Um, yes, but I don't know that I know what it means. I'll explain to you very briefly. And it's, I did do a bit of backtracking in this one. Is my case was that throughout my childhood, I struggled. I had the ideas of writing, but I couldn't really get this structure down. I struggled a lot with spelling and structure. Mm. And I was notoriously clumsy because I've always caused my, I thought it was of my eyesight. Right. It turns out I had something called um, dyspraxia. And dyspraxia actually is a more extreme version of dyslexia. I had like a um, word, um, word dyslexia where I was struggling stringing sentences together. And 
cosmic physical coordination as well. It was dyspraxia, so it's a more extreme version. And that came up uh, halfway through the second year at university when one of the teachers, it was very, very cute in the word, spotted it and referred me in. So then it was like, it made a lot of sense to me at the time because then I learned through that, I had to get in like um, a support worker to help me get through uni and give me specialised equipment, which I use a lot, that say simple stuff in, in the day job nowadays. And it's it's how you adapt to it. And I learned I wanted to be a writer and I wasn't going to let that stop me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, forget wanting to be a writer. You have been a writer since you were seven years old. They were like, hey, would you like a pen? And you're like, I've already bought the notebooks. <laughs> like, you are exactly, into exactly. it. I'm so glad that teacher was able to help help you yeah. find a way to, like, make it better for yourself. Because, yeah. like, I mean, creativity and doing art is an uphill battle for everybody. But, man, if you want to be a writer and you have issues with letters and writing, man... That I'm so yeah. glad that that teacher was so observant and caring that, you know, they were able to direct you to a place where you could find good resources to get it better. Like, ugh. yay for yeah. teachers that, like, care. <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's not enough of them, definitely, with that one. So oh, I'm not going to hear the teacher. I believe she died, actually. Now. So, yeah, she was a great teacher for that, she was. So. But it's yeah. like, through that, it's university, I think, and it's a bit of a tricky one, this one, we deal with, like, poetry like I am. So I know some poets that haven't been formally educated and they're great writers. But sometimes I think you need to know the rules sometimes, some things, even if you're going to break the rules, if that makes sense. Totally. It gives you like a background sometimes, I think. If you're not going to go to university, make sure you're well-read on anything you do. That way then you know what, you know what you're doing to a degree, so that's why. Yeah. I, found it really, I found it really interesting in some ways because I, I probably learned more in some ways actually go into a writing group after I left uni a year or two later. Yeah, how'd you find that group? Because, like, I love that you have a group and that you have a community of people that you can write with, but, yeah. like, for people who are writing at home but, like, would love to connect with other people, how do you even find a writer's group? Yeah, well, this first group I've been in, I've been in about three, I've been in three, right? First one, and... I can't name names for legality reasons, okay, of course. But the first one, and I'm not going to name the group either, it was a really badly run group, to put it bluntly. It was a badly run group. Right. And when me and some other people left that group, we formed our own group, and what we wanted to do was just write, have a, have a laugh and a chat while writing, but make sure we do some writing all the time as well. And I ran that group. Well, I ended up running that group eventually for about nearly 10 years of it. And over lockdown last year, this will make you laugh, Amy, this, because the partners are novelist as well, and a novelist, poet, podcaster, and he, she does all kinds of things like me. But Amanda asked me last year, oh, who's going to be you writing? I'm doing workshops. Should we do a work? Do you want to do a workshop? And what happened was we had a word of a few friends of ours that – just write, write a friend to get on well with. And we did a Zoom writing workshop last March. As a one-off. 16 months later, we're still doing it every fortnight. Oh, my gosh. So you guys are just continuously getting together and working? That's yeah. so great. Yeah. And it is. And what's good is, I get to do it. But ironically, people, we're, people wonder now, we're, the, day, the day we're recording this, as soon as we finish chatting, Amy, in a bit, I'm going to have the tea. Then I've got to log back into Zoom again. I'm doing a workshop tonight. Yeah, you are. Are you like leading them now? Is it like yeah, you I'm, guys? Yeah, I've been leading this one. Yeah, I've been this, I set this one. I set this group up at the end. I have exercises ready for every two weeks normally. I've got Amanda does one of them because she's never really done much teaching before, and but it gives her a bit of experience. And sometimes one of the other guys will chip with one of the exercise, and they'll let me know in advance because there's only about six or seven of us and. If I'm honest, a good workshop, that's all you need. You don't need yeah. 30, 40 people. Cause then it's, it's hard to manage. If this is five or six of you, you can have a good laugh. Yeah. Well, also, five or six is about the number of people in any group that are going to do something. So uh, you've got 30, you've got the five that do stuff. So um, better in writing where it's like you'd like to accomplish the task of writing, like, 
instead of that, you know, you have these people who are dedicated. That must have been really nice to have a group to continuously go back to during all of this shutdown to have like people that you knew you'd always see every couple weeks. Yeah, it's been great. It's been great because I think when most of the people that came to it, so that's why I've got, it's, I mean, my life is a very roundabout way. And most of the people we knew already, there was one we didn't know, we just met her actually as well, but of the first time in person. But what I thought, most of the people came from the, the spoken word open mic night I co run. Mm. So I've been co running an open mic, uh, actually, spoken word open mic. And Alyssa said right. open mic then, big difference. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a spoken word open mic. Yeah. I've been covering in one called Speak Easy now for about four years. And we co run this with a friend of ours called Steve. And Steve originally took it over from somebody else. Then, various reasons, he asked me to come on board. And then he asked Amanda to come on board a, couple of, a month or two later. So there's three of us that run it. So as soon as we went into lockdown last year in England, Speak Easy went on to Zoom. But we'll talk about that later. Huh. But the actual, the very informal the workshop we do came from that, where we had a word with a few people that we really get on with and... Now, now, now this now they're seeing us twice a month on Zoom and yeah. once a month in person. So they're the sick of the sight of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Are you able to go back in person? Just started. Just started last oh, week. Oh, great, great. That's why it's just start. It's a funny one because the state of play in England at the moment is we're still in lockdown until the nineteenth of July. Yeah. Next week we're going to find out more whether it gets fully lifted, but they're talking about lifting everything on yeah. the 19th of July at the moment. So it's a case of wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. never know. And, uh, you know, the powers that be make a decision and then we all sort of vaguely adjust. Uh, yeah, it's been a weird time for sure. But then I'm so glad that you're able to connect with your, you know, social group that does the spoken word open mic together. So it's like the people that you were seeing and that were presenting every week, uh, you know, now you guys get to do the workshops. Now you seem very organized as a teacher. How many, how much experience have you had leading writing groups and coming up with exercises? Cause like good on you for being prepared with exercises for these workshops, as opposed to just being like, Hey guys, what are you working on? Let's talk about, it we can i can help you you know what i mean like you give them something to do that's great about 11 years about 11 years now so i drift i had done it for a couple of years but i've got about 11 years experience running it because the first workshop i went to after i left uni that ran for about five six years and it was chaotically organized yeah. we uh, me and some of the people broke off in 2007 and we did that for about 10 years and then one of the people i ran it with three people um, sadly passed away and then me and another the other one that we give up then basically so I went back to it a couple like I said this year but it was a case of sometimes when you rode a bicycle you, you never forget things sometimes and I knew so all I needed to do was sit down and think usually about an hour before normally to sit down and decide four or five exercises I want this I want the group to tackle them and when you know when you know the group it's like you know what you can get away with sometimes if you know what I mean, or you know what, how we're going to react. It's just like with people reading, really. Yeah. Well, especially since you've been with this group for so long, you have a connection with them. You know how yeah. they are as artists and yeah. what Makes their life output a lot is easier. like. Yeah. Makes life a lot easier. It does. That's why. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I do a lot of improv and my main, um, effort as a teacher is to get the group to be connected in that way so that they begin to feel comfortable because as soon as you feel comfortable with other people your your creative output is better you are able to and you feel more free to to create things that you wouldn't normally do if you have people that you trust around you so it's great that you have not only that you have right now this like solid group of people that you've been working with during the pandemic but like 
it's great that like there's this whole writer scene in your area that like allows you to have these writers groups and like help each other in great things. So are you like, is everybody in your writers group, uh, you know, writing different kinds of things? Some people are writing poetry. Some people are writing novels. Like how does it generally work? Or are they all performers doing spoken word pieces? It's a bit of everything that makes sense to us. The way the best way to look at it, Amy, is really is in my case, I'm really a poet and I do ambient music and other bits and pieces. Amanda, the partner, is a novelist as well as doing a poet. And so it's like some of the exercises, she'll go along and start doing ex- writing the first part of what, which has happened before now, where she's done the first part of what's turned into a book. And some of the people will do poetry, some bit of prose, flash fiction. There's no actual set. I don't tend to like really saying, spend 15 minutes writing this as a poem because yeah. I know it's, it doesn't always suit people if you force them down that well that way sometimes. Yeah. That's why I want to try and keep it as fresh as I can to make we all have a laugh, really have a good time. And, and that's what it does. If you give them the freedom, I think people work right better. Yeah. So are are the people writing things and then presenting them in the in the workshop, or is it like I, they write them and then present them at the open mic? It ends up in a bit of, bit of both. Because <laughs> um, what happens in the workshop is that I always tell, tell people, and it's, it's optional, because only a few of us, if you like what you've wrote, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. If you don't like it, don't want to share it. No problems. Yeah. So usually people end up sharing it, whether they then do anything with it is another ball game. Oh, well, it sounds because, like you provide a nice safe yeah. space for them. So that's what they, I want to do because yeah. I like to be I like it to be creative. I like it to be supportive, and I'm always believing workshops. Yeah. You know, it's a case of experimenting, trying something different out. Because I came out of the piece fit very recently. It's gone down a storm in the open mic circuit in Manchester, where about a swearing unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just because it came, came out they, they, it dropped a number of F-bombs and other various inappropriate words in it, it had the group cracking up laughing and then I knew straight away it would work well reading them out performing them so <laughs> All right, great. Yeah, I like it. I like how you and your group are creating wild uh, unicorn pieces. This sounds yeah, wonderful. That's just me. That's just me. <laughs> um, Amanda's done, I don't know, she's done one about, she started off, she wrote a book about spoof clickbait pieces. Hmm. And she's, she, if I can find it online, you can. And she, her first piece she wrote for that book actually ended up getting performed on the BBC radio. Wow, awesome. That's, yeah, that's fun. why. So it's, and, and she couldn't believe she, they was, that's made them out of the big radio station in England, one of them. And they absolutely loved it. So, yeah, it, you don't know what you're going to get sometimes. So it's yeah. really Man, that's so great. And nice that, um, you know, you guys are connected enough that somebody could, you know, hear or see her piece and be like, hey, let's put it on the BBC. Let's do it. Like, that's really great to get it up on, you know, television or radio. Like, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Good for y'all. That's um, what it was, that's what it was, that's what it was for Amanda. It meant a lot to her. So yeah, yeah. But, so it's, but I found myself it as a writer because I said for us, so I've been writing for years now and I've done books as well. Yeah. It's doing this sort of workshop. It, it lets me gives me it's an ideas generator because I did a started a book off on haikus last year, which became a part of the last book but one, which was started off in the workshop because it came off an exercise Amanda said, and I thought to myself, I'll try it as a haiku couple of haikus and over six months I wrote six well about 50 odd haikus set in an underground train station in lockdown so it was just like it was it comes the ideas of funny things at the best of times yeah yeah absolutely I'm so excited about how you guys are inspiring each other in this group that's so awesome so you're you've clearly been involved in this creative stuff for a, a long time. You're like, a, you know, deep in the community of your uh, of your area. Uh, all the writers, you know, doing the workshops and whatnot. How do you keep yourself um, going? I mean, we mentioned we talked uh, before we started recording that you know you have another job. So like, how do you keep the creativity flowing when you're probably tired when you get home from work? And strange to me because I first of all got rid of television about ten years ago. Okay. 
I will occasionally watch on Amanda the same. She's not on TV in 20 years. But we will occasionally watch Frozen Amazon Prime or Netflix. But we don't come home and put the television on. Yeah. Well, I guess we're both not working. It's a case of switching from one thing to another. And a lot of it is me just having a well-organized diary. Yeah. I guess I, have to, I will try and do one podcast a week on my sis spoken like Make sure I try and spend an evening or two doing my, doing my music and a bit of time writing and journalism, just keeping on top of everything using a well-organized diary. Yeah. All right, good. I like this. This is good advice. Just keep it organized. One day per creative pursuit. That's really good. I like that you have like a day for music. So it how did you get it? Doesn't into- always go that way. It doesn't <laughs> always go that way. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, well intentions, well intentions. How did you? Uh, how did you get involved in music? You're you've clearly been a writer forever, right? But how did you start creating music in, uh, in during this journey? Well, that was a while ago, to be you, because long story short of it, and I met a guy a couple some years ago through a friend of mine, actually, who lives in Bournemouth. And I went down to see this friend in Bournemouth, and I got talking to her, boy, her boyfriend's best mate, and we found we had the identical taste in music. <laughs> And he was a he was a guitarist and a keyboardist, and I was a poet and I, who can't sing. He's stating I can't sing, right? <laughs> but what happened was um, we got talking to Keith, and I ended up saying we're going to say we get in touch on Facebook in oh eight or nine, and we got, both got the stage where he was loving the work I was doing and I loving his music in the band. We put a bit of music together on the internet, then eventually started once twice a year coming down up and down the either him to see me or me to see him and with work of material. Oh, awesome. And so- it, it used to be like basically spoken word music over various degrees of music. And I'm not saying some of it is more tuneful than others. <laughs> <Put it wrong. laughs> oh, man. So are, is all of your music then uh, in collaboration uh, with this friend, Keith? I No, it's Keith. Basically, he's got, like, he's got about four or five kids now. <laughs> so we occasionally work on projects together, not as much nowadays. He hasn't got time. I went um, a couple of years down the line. I he got married. I went into a long-term relationship. And as I went into a long-term relationship, the time basically just wasn't what it was. And eventually, I moved. To, I split this relationship. And then I decided I want to do music again. And I basically went into doing, doing music by myself one day with Ocean in the Buckle. And that was about five and a half years ago. Yeah. How do you make the music? Like you... Keyboard. I've got, I've got a keyboard. I've got a keyboard, like uh, a USB keyboard. Yeah. And it gets plugged into my laptop. And I've got other bits of equipment that is too complicated to list. Totally. But I end up build. Yeah. I end up building sample banks of sound. Yeah. And by, by basic processing all that mathematics, I can often work out where things go. Ooh. I'm not I'm not professionally trained as a keyboard as a pianist any stretch of thought, but it's a case of recognizing how to mix and how to be, build sound layer on layer and build sounds up on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty great. You and, and then, my husband then, would get along. You, he does a similar thing. <laughs> and the more I don't know what your husband's like with music. My case was Another interest I had when I was growing up, I was massive into space and astronomy. And I got back into it about five years ago. And nearly all of the music I do now for Ocean of Bock is space related. Hmm. So it's like, it's, I always tell people if you envisage you're up in space, some of the music I do is, is like that in space. Hmm. I like it. That's super fun. Oh, cool. Space travel. My uh, my little kid loves space travel, so I'm into it. We'll start playing the music while we uh, while we pretend to be astronauts around the house. I think you play some, of my, play some of my music. It'll probably scare your child. <laughs> I really need to send you a link to my husband's music. You really. <laughs> I, <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> We've got some odd stuff, and it's great. Um, yeah, but, we'll, we'll, uh, trade, we'll trade links afterwards. Then, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, ambient electronic, a little weird. Yeah, we got that. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> plus, like, you know, what's, what's ambient electronic? 
electronic if it isn't a little unusual, right? It's the it the layering of sounds is so cool. I love that stuff, you know. So, so you know, it'll be great. It's uh, I'm sure it's wonderful. And if it's cathartic creatively for you, then hey, it is wonderful. It started off me though, and that started off because um, after I'd come up my last relationship for Amanda, I was having sleep problems, massive sleep problems, and I used to be. I used to do that sort of music, just trying to get back into it. Did, so that's where it all came from, basically. So. Just to put you to, like, you did the music as a way to relax yourself, or yeah. you made the music so you could listen to it and then fall asleep? A bit of both. A bit of both. Oh, a bit yeah. of both. And it was like, I know, it's just a case of it. I think, as we, I think, always believe it, is as with the writing. When you get to a certain stages, you keep doing over and over, improving. It's you can find opportunities to open up to yourself, and and as I like it's I've got the stage now where I know about four record labels, and I've had bits and pieces coming out of all of them quite steadily throughout the year. That's great. That's great. Absolutely. I mean, sometimes uh, I say you've got to just continue. I'm sorry. I don't look the money on this. <laughs> I'm sorry, you keep cutting out. You keep glitching. Oh. Right, try. Right. I don't make a lot of money on Ocean of the Buckle, but I have great fun. <laughs> Who makes money on their art? Not me. Oh, man. Now, I mean, the thing about it is... <laughs> The the thing about creating stuff, sometimes it's the thing that, you know, puts money in your bank account, and sometimes it's the thing that fills your soul. So it's okay. I mean, there's no, uh, there there's something wonderful about both options. Like, to be able to do something that is uh, just for you, or to be able to do something that soothes you. Like, I love the idea that you created this music to start, like, soothing yourself. Why not? Absolutely. Creativity is exactly for that. You know? I mean, <laughs> uh, I appreciate your your caveat. Oh, I'm not making any money. Well, I mean, <laughs> sure, great. So, I, I write thousands of things, and so I don't think it's ever made me any money. But that doesn't mean I'm not, like, excited to continue to do it, right? Yeah, so that's exactly what, that's what, exactly what I'm like. It's the half time is the pleasure of doing stuff. And I guess the problem with the poetry, anything I'd create it in, yeah. it's the outpour of it sometimes, it's the finishing of a project. I mean, yeah. Plus, like, you know, the, the beauty of being able to have a day job and then do it, like, a lot of people will be like, oh, I can't believe that a person has a day job and then they do art. And I'm like, why? Like everybody lives their life, whatever way they want to live their life and don't judge it because the beauty of you being able to do your art in a separate way is that you're not beholden to making money with it. You're not stressed out about paying rent while you're writing this thing, right? Like you're able to enjoy it. You're able to let it be your outlet. And it's not something that, you know, there's a lot of talk about how people should take their hobbies and turn them into revenue streams. And that's not always the best plan, I think. I think sometimes there's beauty in being able to um, just do your art for you, for for just creation's sake, right? I mean, this is not to say that the idea that Ocean in a Bottle being on some record labels isn't super amazing and great. Absolutely it is. If if it turns out that our art makes us money, yay, I love it. But to it's not like have to rely on it. It's a bonus. Yes. It's a bonus. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's a bonus to the creative fulfillment I get for just doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, man, that's super awesome. And I love that you, like, you went down the musical rabbit hole. You know what I mean? Like, you... Like, as has been established, you are a writer. You are a writer forever. The, it is, like, in your soul. You are going to be writing no matter what. You Nothing was going to stop you. And that's so great. It's, like, amazing that that's what you're doing. But the fact that you, like, connected with this other artist and were like, I'm going to open my mind up to a different kind of art that I don't usually do. Like, that's super cool. Like, and and that's not, like... You know, you weren't, the other thing that I think is interesting about it is like, 
you're not like 22 when you meet this guy, right? So you're, the beauty of it is, and the thing that I think a lot holds a lot of people back is they think, oh, at, at a certain point in my life, I'm no longer creative. Or at a certain point in my life, I, that's it. I just can't do anymore. Uh, what? No, you can make new discoveries. You can make new friends. You can make new collaborations every day of your life till you die. Like, don't let this idea that like, okay, well, I'm an adult now. I'm not going to do it. How is that? Um, um, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Like, does, is there anybody in your life that's like, Hey man, why are you still doing this? Or is everyone super supportive? My yeah. mom. <laughs> my mom. <laughs> My mum, she won't remember ever got to, I never got to grips with it. But she, my dad, my dad understands it to a degree, but my mum's never got to grips with it. So, and it's like each stage of my life, honestly, Amy, where things have, have took on moved in a different direction. Yeah. My mum, I remember my mum saying that I'm a poet in the mid thirties. You never make money off poetry. Then when her music came into it, when I got just turned forty, she said to me, "You never make money on your mute on your music." Then when I became a journalist three years ago, she said to me, I don't believe you, you look at the journalist now as well. So it's like, it's, <laughs> it's, I, I think she's starting to understand now to a degree. It's like, it's, it is what it is. Cause everything's my life is just moving. It moves onwards all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, and like I said a moment ago, like, at least you're making money with your day job. Like, you don't have to worry about it. It's like, yeah, I might not make money with this writing, but don't worry about it. Like, don't let it be, you know, if you love going to that open, uh, that spoken word open mic and being there with that community and being part of it, if you like meeting everybody on Zoom and doing the writing groups, why not have stuff in your life that you like? Why does it all have to be work? <laughs> exactly, exactly, because it's, I told myself that years ago, where I believe there's more to life than just doing the day job. Yeah. And I, I love the day job, no problem with doing it, I've done it for 10 yeah. years now, I love doing it, love the job I do, but oh, there's more, I want more from life than that. Yeah. And that's what, the job I do, thankfully, the day job is on Flexi, so I'm used to done most days for three o'clock, half three. Great. It's not like a half five, six o'clock job, which I've done before and I hate it. Sure. But finishing the time I do, I've got time to do other projects. With space, I've got more space, so it's super down to the ground. It's yeah. just the way it goes, like I said, but it's, it's, I never planned, as some people were bearing in mind. When I started off in poetry, I thought I'd just be a poet. I never envisaged I'd end up doing music. I never envisaged I'd end up doing podcasting. I'm, what, currently on to five different series, four or five different series. And then journalism on top of it is... Everything's just gone in a logistical direction. <laughs> yeah. So how, how did you get involved in the podcasting? Was it like different friends had different ideas, or oh, how did that stuff all get started? This is a bit of a this is a, this is a funny story. This one, you, you're going to regret having me on today because I'll keep you for a free hour episode. But <laughs> <laughs> um, spoke label my big podcast is and it's very similar to this. It's an informal chat series. Uh, that started off at the end of 2015. First session began in 2016 with one of my best mates who's a novelist, a science fiction novelist. And what happened was we met up in the pub one night for a chat and in the area where he lives in there called Bolton. And I had the phone on me and he said to, he said to, me, and said to me, why do we do this? Why do you do this a podcast and I'll be your first guest? So the first session with him well, went on for nearly two hours and I'm not going to recommend you listen to it because you just hear us getting drunker and drunker as the night goes up. <laughs> but a couple of weeks later, I ended up, um, I met somebody else that I know, and I told them about this. And they said, oh, I'll be your second guest. And so that one was a little bit, I was a bit more structured on. We met on the week after and did it in a coffee shop properly. And then two became three, three became four. And I've done a lot, a lot, very bluntly so. But I did a lot last year when I went into lockdown because of the day job. The day job sent me home mm. on full pay. And I was just doing podcasts after podcasts. But I've done around about 300 sessions now in five and a half years. Awesome. Awesome. That's why. And then one became two when Amanda was doing a book review podcast by herself. Didn't enjoy the experience. Asked me 
could we do a relaunch and I'd be a co-host and we're up to episode 44 and that now more than a monthly one and I do a wrestling podcast with two gentlemen and we've got a weekly one we speak to London DJ as well awesome I mean how do you even juggle all that that's so much uh, well the wrestling one is about once every two months so that's just easy that yeah. when we meet up when, meet, when I meet up two lots in question one's a London based DJ and one's an Irish radio broadcaster or some, some kind of a doctor so it's like so we end up with the three of us meet up on Zoom to talk about one wrestling programme and we have we have, all it is is just a pair of us to quote one of the lads shooting the breeze for about two hours yeah occasionally talking about wrestling yeah basically so yeah <laughs> that's just such an unstructured it's just like free free geeks to have them off basically yeah there's a lot of those there's a whole genre of podcasts that's just three dudes talking about something so it's all right yeah. you know also i was gonna say about your first spoken label uh, mm. uh episode there are also uh, a lot of podcasts that are just people talking and getting drunker and drunker as they do so, <laughs> yeah. so well, it's got the, its place <laughs> unfortunately nowadays man i'm not really allowed to drink nowadays because sure. no uh no three days i haven't really old yet is i'm not much diabetic nowadays uh-huh. so i became diabetic nine years ago yeah so i've that one, the first one I got drunk with, was the last time I did any serious drinking. I've not been drinking, but I don't, I don't drink nowadays. Yeah. So, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly helps you get all the things done that you're doing. Yeah. You have so many things. You're like, That's well, why. I could have this drink, but I have three podcasts to do tonight. So, <laughs> yeah. That's what it comes like sometimes. Uh, I've, got edited, I've, got ed- I've got a backlog of editing I need to do. Yeah. And then bits and pieces. And it's a case of, I, have, I often have a list. In my diary, what I need to get done on some weeks, mm. and it's and like I know when I'm doing podcast editing, it can take hours. Yeah, yeah, it can take hours. Yeah, the the after work, uh, they don't tell you about that. They don't tell you about all that stuff. You know, you thought, oh, I could just record something and it'll be great, but then you're like, yes, here are the list of forty seven things you have to do now that you're done to make it a show. Oh, yeah. man. But th- I mean, I guess oh. that's also like what, you know, I-, I want to put a little effort in. I want to like, you know, that's the extra effort of my art. You know, how can I package this and present it to the audience? That's uh, that's one of the ways in which you can make your podcast uh, stand out is like making the packaging uh, that much more enticing to the audience. So. Oh yeah, completely, completely. Yeah. Spoken label and doing me awful chat like yours. I often, I don't set questions. Don't believe in setting questions. Yeah. I will set the bar. I, I try to explain to people that we want to cover from point A to point B, and what we talk about in between it. It's like the <laughs> shoot the breeze basically. But I know certain things I've got to make sure we cover. So that's why. So it's just bullet points. One and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I- uh, that's why before we started recording, I was like, hey, if we go down a weird rabbit hole, it seems fine to me. Because in my mind, these are interviews for creative people about creative people. Like, how do you do it? How do you make it happen? Right. I love that you are so, you know, strongly connected to your creative force that it it just keeps creating new projects for you that you're like, oh, I have this great idea. Oh, I met this person and we're so inspired to do something else. And like, you still have that creative brewing going in your workshops. Like, that's so cool that you have all this inspiration around you all the time. Are you, do you find that you got involved in, I mean, the first writers group that you were in that wasn't really great, I feel like that experience, even though it was negative, probably led you to make a lot of decisions about, oh, well, I'm going to do it better. And so the way I want to do it is X, Y, Z. Um, how has your you know process evolved? Like, how do you get the writing done? And is it different than you used to? Or, um, or you know, is it like, oh, I've, I've always done this and all the time. This is how I get writing done. No, very all the time. I mean, it's, the way I look at it is, I think it's happened to a degree because I'm living with a fellow creative person. We're often pushing each other, go in different directions, try out new approaches all the time. A lot of it is experimentation. I do, everything we might create doesn't always come out of the best. 
not all projects you do come out successful. Now I've had it where some projects I've done have come out an absolute disaster and we are working with people and a lot of it is everything that you do in it comes works or doesn't work, you learn something from it. And I've always tried bonus firm belief. I've, I know some writers that stand still with the work. They, they do the same kind of stuff all the time. But I think if you stand still with your creativity, you end up going around ever decreasing circles. Mm. You've got to be constantly doing like point A to point B, point C and point D. Now, I've got a quote for you, actually, if you bear with me two seconds on this. Mm-hmm. But I think sure. it sums this up. Yeah. Because one of my favourite singers is this uh, American singer, actually, called Scott F- Scott Walker. And he was in a band called the Walker Brothers. On the back of his fourth album, there's this quote. I'll find it for you. There you are. I think, I think this sums it up, okay? It's quoted to the writer Albert Cams, okay? And the quote is, A man's work is nothing but this slow trek to rediscover through the detours of art, those two or three and simple images in whose presence his heart first opened. I think that sums it up really, because I think when you get a really good idea that you like, you will find a different way of approaching it and it will lead you in the direction to the next one. Yeah. Plus, I like the idea of that quote with reference to the idea that, like, even as kids, we had the kernels of the creative ideas in us. That, like, the stories that are coming out now were always there and are potentially, like, something that we saw at, like, age two that we didn't, like, cognitively understand. But now at, like, 43, I'm able to, like, say it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's a, that's a beautiful idea. The journey uh, of an artist in that way. Yeah. I think so. so I'm, f- I'm 50 next year and I can look back at some of my pieces I wrote with my early teens. I wouldn't necessarily write them that way nowadays, but there was a, you find there's links sometimes to whether it's consciously or unconsciously to work that comes later. Yeah. And work that you projects you do when you get older. Yeah. No, I think that all the time, I just recently took a, um, or I'm currently taking a short story class and I'm writing, um, in that short story class, just in, uh, the specific format of short story. But I have all these ideas of different things to write. And I was like, what works well with this? And I realized that the story that I'm writing is a story that I've had in my notebooks for maybe eight years. I've been writing these characters and writing different points of view uh, a bunch. Like I have done this um, story from different directions five or six different times. And if I was the kind of person who was like, this isn't working, forget about it. I could have thrown it away, but I didn't. I I believe that characters that like and storylines, they just keep coming up for you. So if they keep coming up for you, like keep writing them, right? Because sometimes I think that you need to get to a place in your own understanding of the world before you can tell that story, right? Like yeah, definitely. I I am a much different writer than like you mentioned, you as a child. I'm a much different writer now than I was in my 20s when I was a kid. Absolutely. You know, I've seen the world. I've seen different things. I've had different experiences now. This story needed to wait till I got to this point, till I had seen certain things. There are kernels from my childhood all the way through it for sure. But now I'm like, oh, I'm able to see a new way to tell the story. And I think that it's really important to like, you know, keep track of clearly you're a guy that keeps records and I appreciate that. But like for people who are listening that maybe aren't like, if there's an idea that like really excites you, even if when you go to write it, it doesn't feel right. Save it. Keep that stuff, put it aside in a folder or something because in 10 years, maybe you might be like, wait a minute. I know exactly what that guy needs to do now and you can find it and then just write that story. There's nobody saying, Oh, you can't go back to those old ideas. Yes, you can use them. Let that, let it inspire you. Like, 
what if you were to try to write the same story? Like you give yourself a writing prompt every year on the same date. You know what I mean? Think of how different the stories would be, even with the same writing prompt. The development of your own understanding of the world, of how to create characters and stuff, has to change and ebb and flow, especially with all the people around you, your community, your partner, where it's like you're, you've got so much creative flow around you. Oh, man. I have done a book on, that's probably close to that, is when I've talked about, I've just bought a book out, another book of haikus out recently. Going this way, yes, you might have this one interesting called Haiku of Life, where I've gone along and told a haiku every year in my life of one specific memory. Some of the memories on them, I probably, I think I've come back in other pieces. So it's like prior to that. So I, so I think that covers your angle there. Mm. But I think it's not, wasn't conscious. That's for sure of it. Yeah. Are you, do you journal? Like, meaning like your personal stuff? No, I'm not, I don't journal. No, I've never, I've never quite got into journaling, John Shea. No, me neither. I, I try. I own. I only use. I have a journal for really intense times. So it's like if I if there's no way that I feel if I feel like I just have so much going on and I can't deal with it, I have a journal, and it's usually for negative stuff. It's usually like I can't handle this thing that's going on in my life. So I hide that journal. No one looks at that journal. But um, but at the same time, like I don't write in everything in something every day, like this is what's happening, stuff like that. I kind of wish that I did purely because I don't personally have a great memory. You know what I mean? Like, so when I look at photos, you know, photos are great, but if I can't remember who's in the picture, then it's not helpful to me. Right. Like if I'm like, I remember that this is a summer camp I went to when I was 20 but I don't know who that guy is like that, you know, that's a shame. But if I wrote something down, maybe I would, I don't know. I can beat myself up uh, about not journaling. I suppose I don't need to. Yeah. I think I, I, don't say, it's, I used to, it's bizarre me when I was younger, I used to have a really bad memory, mm. but I think the older I've got, the better I've got with it. Cause mm. I've, I've had people telling me this for on the poems and they said to me, they don't know how much, how I remember some of some these stories sometimes. And, it's probably down to the fact I'm used to telling stories now mm. where I could probably I used to probably handle them better in my head, I reckon, sometimes. Well, you know, they say that storytelling is the way that we understand the world and that repeated storytelling, well, interestingly, I've heard that repeated storytelling of an event in your life, actually, every time you tell the story, it gets further and further away from what actually happened. Like, isn't that like the idea of the always blows my mind? Because I, like you, have a handful of stories that I tell over and over. There's like, oh, yeah, I can tell you about this one. Oh, I'll tell you about the time that this happened. Just basic, like, icebreaker stories or like oh what you need me to be in your show right now yeah sure I got something um but I definitely feel like them every time I perform them they're definitely f a step away from what really happened you know because you you make with storytelling you make things make sense you make things connect and sometimes in real life they don't yeah, no, I completely agree. I think as well as if, if you're looking at areas, more often you tell a story sometimes. Mm. And there was an American writer, and I forget, Spalding Gray, if you heard of him. Mm -hmm. And he's worth researching him, if you know, people haven't heard of him. He's died, he died a couple of years ago, but he was actually a stand-up storyteller. And he used to go along and he'd do full shows for audiences on tour and start off the tour, not got a clue what he was going to say, and as the story, the tour developed, the story he was telling every night would change. Like his own memories would look at things in different ways. Yeah. So by the end of it, like a 20-day tour, he'd then go and write the book, and the book would have started off completely different from what he started off with the story. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, there's also something to be said for the reaction of an audience, for sure. You know, it's like having editors in front of you immediately, you know. So when you do your spoken word open mic um, previous to, you know, the shutdown, for you, do you find that um, the audience uh, helps you to edit the work that you present to them? Yes, because definitely, because whenever you're doing live shows like that, it's a case of looking at people and you can see what parts of any piece you do go down well with people. And in some cases, which pieces go down well with people as well. Because certainly when I've, cause I've been doing performance stand-up poetry you know, for about 15 years now, and it's a case of back in the early days, I'd go along read a piece and come off stage afterwards thinking, why didn't they understand it? Then I have to, well, sometimes I used to back on look at it thinking, well, that ending probably confused them. That middle bit didn't work. It's, a lot of it is, is self reevaluation. And it's, it's the same goes for if you're ever doing submissions. If you ever get a submission back and you think the piece is perfect for a magazine, you have to, I'm always believing you go away and look at it and think, why was it turned down? Was it turned down because of the volume? Or they've had thousands of attention, they just don't like the piece, didn't understand it. A lot of it is, I think as a writer, I think you've got to be looking at, and it's a funny thing to say, so I would never have done this when I was younger, is I don't think that a piece at a point probably can ever be quite finished sometimes. You could go along and probably do two, three hundred drafts on it if you're not careful. Hmm. Yeah, I try myself not to get too precious with stuff that I write, uh, especially when it is going to be performed by someone that's not me. So I've done a bunch of uh, like sketch comedy. And so I'll write a sketch and then hand it to actors and then they do with it what they're going to do with it. Right. And the first couple of years that I did it, I got really like annoyed and mad when they like didn't memorize the exact lines or they like changed the joke. And it was like, no, it's not that it's this. And then I was like, you got to let what happens happen. Like in the journey of a script that is to be performed, you know, you have to be open to the fact that it might change. Like, I love the story of Spalding Gray, you know, starting with a plan at the beginning of the tour and coming out with something totally different at the end. And that being like the journey he's looking for. Oh. You raise a good point there because you're looking at, um, say, comedy, for example. Comedy is such a subjective word. And you're looking at it. Uh, what one person may find hilarious, the other may not. But you're also looking at like how tastes and stuff change from country to country. Mm. And if you look at the centre humour in America, it is completely different to what's in America in England. Because people I've re- where people research it myself, usually American humour is much much more I find almost slapstick. Cause like if you look at like a lot of these silent comedy, it's much more visual. But England, English comedy tends to be very structured very differently. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting to see what works with different audiences, different groups, different age groups, um, different parts of town. Um, Because I did a lot, I've done a lot of live comedy here in Austin, and they're just different neighborhoods. You know, you do it at this club, this crowd's watching it. You do it at this club, this kind of crowd's watching it. And so whenever I develop a show, I'll say to them, who's the audience here? Like, who comes? You know, like this crowd, okay, they're all in their early 20s, and they're mostly, uh, you know, like uh, politically liberal. Okay, great. We'll make sure that the jokes and the ideas fit that crowd, right? You're not going to make some joke that they're going to be like, what? Are you saying something about me? It's like, no, no, we wouldn't do that because we know who the audience is, right? And uh, and I love the idea that the way that comedy uh, works in different places, I, I mean, there's so many factors to that, and I just love it. I think it's great. I love watching um, other countries' art and being like, okay, 
what, how did this come? And like research how it got started, you know, even like boy bands from other countries, right? What was it? My, my kid had recently happened upon like a Korean boy band and I was all like, what's this? All right, let's get into it. And like, I went down a huge rabbit hole, like looking into them, like, oh, what is this? Oh, I see. This is how they were run. This is how this got created. Oh my goodness. I was like, oh, they dance so great. Oh, well, they're professional dancers. Oh, okay. You know, so it's like artists develop different projects, different inspirations, the beauty of the different cultures that inspire them. Um, and I love that, you know, you and I are from different cultures, inspiring different kinds of art, right? But we're still out there doing it and making it happen and trying to be active in our own communities where we are, right? Um, that being said, the other beautiful thing about, you know, the internet and and stuff is that we can talk, like that you and I can connect and be friends and be like, hey, what's going on over there? Oh, really? This is the funniest thing? Oh, okay, maybe I can see if I can work that. You know, what, what thing? work in different places can inspire you to do something yeah, else. You're right. like, I never even knew that that was an option, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the perks of music on Zoom or something like that, because I can, it's let you talk to people, particularly over lockdown in both our countries. You've learned how to, you've met other people on it, and you've taught different artists different ways of life. And that's that is, if ever you do this sort of thing, a good session for me is like a good workshop. You get something from it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Human beings just connecting and, and being, um, and being together to create something together. I love that. I love that. So, yeah, sure, sure. so final question for me to you, what is the thing right now that is creatively exciting you? Like what project are you working on or what's the like next thing? What's the thing brewing in your brain right now that is exciting you creatively? Sure. Now um, I've got, I've got, I've just bought a book out of haikus, and I've got a book of journalism on the articles already set, so they're done. Um, currently, I'm working on a poetry book at the moment, and this is actually some like a complete thing that I've done before, where I'm doing it's a, it's a load of imaginary letters between a couple. After it basically started off in an affair, and then it went something. To a relationship and then unfortunately collapsed at the end of it so this has took about three and a half years to write so far it's taking time oh. it's such a multi-layered piece I've done yeah. about 60 pieces in it and i've done eight pages and it'll need another 70 i reckon a bit of a three or four years this one's done so yeah. that one's that's a big project writing wise i don't there's going to be other bits come out before i get this book done because it's i'm one of these sort of poets as writers, I've I've got I've often, I've got folders, yeah, and I often like put things in folders and it builds up naturally. Yeah, that's yeah. why. But that's the big frog. That's the big one. I'll get that done for a day. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, ab I mean, I really uh, honor you as an artist that you have projects that you know are going to take multiple years. Like, there's something really beautiful about that. Like that that you have the the patience the the confidence in your own continued ability that you're like yeah i'm gonna create this and this might be a five or six year project but every minute of it is worth the time that i'm putting into it and that's yeah, that's that's, amazing. that's it correct that's what it's gonna that's, it's been like that for a while for me because i don't want to stay too long this now looking at the time for you but the second book was the crunchy for me because i did the first poetry book in 2010 Mm -hmm. It took me five years to do the second book. Yeah. Because it's a case of, I wrote about 200 poems it, and it's a case of, I couldn't get the, the actual piece I wanted in it. Wrote 50, dumped 40 of them, wrote another 50, that became the book, and I kept 10 of them with the first lot. It just, <laughs> just went on forever. Yeah. So that's why, but it's, it goes that way with some projects. As an artist, some projects, you know, if you if you really want it, you have to work on it. Yeah. Oh, Andy, it has been so great to have you on the podcast. You've been so inspiring to me as a writer, like just all these <laughs> ideas and community. Oh, it's so, so cool. I'm so glad that this is the, you know, that you have this crowd with you that you're able to work on um, all sorts of different projects and that you have the support of your friends um, as you go through it. Like, thank you so much for being on the podcast. 
been a pleasure. Really, really enjoyed it. So, everybody, this is loads. Subscribe is my philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Subscribe to all of his podcasts. If you haven't subscribed to, to this one, do that one too. Do all of them, right? <laughs> Because you do it when you do a job like mine, it's great because the day job is I could actually have iTunes on all day. So I will sit there and have to do five hours of this the podcasts. Wow, that's fun. That's great. Yeah, but, but Man, it's, well, not how fun. Be, not, it's not it's not gonna be a manager's waving at you trying to get your attention for two hours. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so cut this part where you say you listen to podcasts all day so your boss doesn't get mad. Got it. You no problem. <laughs> <laughs> he, he won't care. <laughs> yes, I got the word on. <laughs> oh God, you're so funny. Oh man, awesome, cool. Well, thank you for being part of it. It's been a great chat. I've had a nice chat yeah, with you. Enjoyed. Really enjoyed it, Amy. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs>